And I remember feeling so kind of sad, but also mad of like, I had nothing. I had everything with Jesus, but like these kiddos had nothing. They didn't have clothes. They didn't have parents, places to live. And I'm coming home to a car, a house, parents that were going to provide for me, all those things. So I just remember thinking like, can I just sell everything? Like Jesus is enough. And I saw that there. What I heard you say in that time apart, it, that time that you were set apart, consecrated unto the Lord, you drew near. Yeah. You learned some and I love to call it like avenues to the kingdom. Like you learned avenues to the kingdom, how to be with him, how to be in him, yeah. prayer, getting in the word and reading the Bible in three months, Maddie, that's incredible. That's yeah. like, talk about changing your life. Even telling my husband, like, I love you so much, but like, you're not even enough. You know, it's like, if Jesus isn't the right. main thing, that's right. And if he's not enough for you, nothing else ever will be. And I'm always reminded of Ecclesiastes of like, anything you do outside of Jesus, you're just chasing the wind and it leaves you empty. So I'm like, Jake, I love you more than anything in the world, but I'll always love God more. And so Man. it's like the understanding of Jesus has yeah. to be your everything, no matter how much you hear it and how, you know, how it doesn't really register until it registers. So. Hey, welcome to the Love Church Story Podcast. We're so excited that today we have Maddie Clayton <laughs> with us. I am so glad that you're taking a minute out of your day to share with everybody who God is in your life and what he's been up to, testifying of his goodness. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you do at Love Church so people know who they're listening to today. Yes, um, my title is Love Kids Director, so children's director, and it is the greatest joy, not only mm. with the kiddos that I love so dearly, but the people I get to work with is like the greatest blessing. You guys had mentioned one time what's your dream job? And it's so cheesy, but I'm like, I am living and I'm doing my dream job. So it's, it doesn't even feel like a job. It's just mm. a joy to work every day. And every, it's so fun to see every student that comes around you lights up. So we're <laughs> so the thankful for the gifts God's given you. We'll celebrate those a little bit more. Before we get to that though, I'd love to start off with a little bit about the way that God dropped you into this earth through your family and kind of what it looked like um, as you were raised, like give people that are listening kind of the background testimony of your faith practice kind of growing up. And then even from there, maybe like at what point did you meet Jesus and what did that look like? And, and anything you want to fill in, paint, paint the picture. I'm giving you the outline, but you go ahead and paint the picture yeah. for us. Oh goodness. This could probably be five hours. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I have to say my parents are like my heroes. Mm -hmm. I love them so dearly. I honor them, obey them, respect them, the whole shebang. Um, but I was born and raised in Omaha. We were raised in Gretna. Um, my parents are married to this day. I have an older sister, um, who's my best friend since we were, since we were, um, little, I have a younger brother. And although I could share so much, I feel like the core memories I have from childhood are, um, being best friends really. And like with my parents, which seems odd, but there was a separation of like, you're our parents and we're going to respect you and honor you and obey you. But also we did everything together. So I feel like my parents did a great job of including us mm -hmm. and we would do active things or go on vacations. And I would say more often than not, I was with my family over friends and to this day I'm thankful for, cause it's still that same way. Um, some people will be like, your dad's 54 and he's, you know, hanging out at the lake with you. And it's just, it's always been that way. Um, and then the second part of that, I would say, I can't remember a weekend that we weren't in the gym <laughs> or on a field or doing something. So we were always together. And then the second part of it was like sports and being active. And we were all in competitive sports, which is funny because we weren't in church on Sunday. <laughs> it leads to that. Um, but so thankful for just the way that we are raised from the world. I feel like you would look at us and you would think like that family has got it all together. But then the lens of Jesus and through the spiritual side, it was very much lacking. Um, and it's cool now that I have the understanding and thanks to obviously your teaching and like guidance, but of sacrificial things, because there's so many things that I saw in my parents and their marriage, how they raised us that was so broken. And it's like the Romans, like 10, 14 is you don't know what you don't know, or they don't know unless they're told. And so I think of it as like, if their parents weren't teaching them, then my parents weren't teaching us. And so I had no understanding of relationship with Jesus growing up. I, and now I look at it, I'm like, I thought my life was perfect. I was given everything that the world had to offer. Although my parents' marriage wasn't the best, but um, 
I didn't know Jesus. And I know my parents believed in God. My grandparents believe in God, but they also didn't have it didn't know what access looked like to relationship with Jesus. Therefore, my siblings and I didn't. Um, so we would we would go to church on Christmas and Easter, like the CEO Christians. And um, I would say the taste that I got of God was at my aunt's house. And they were plugged into a church and they had a godly marriage. Um, and we would, they would read the Bible, have a kid's Bible, but they would pray before bed. And I remember thinking like, I'm super nervous. I don't know what this is. Like they would, we would be laying in bed. I remember there would be bunk beds and they would come in and pray with us. Mm. Had never seen that before. And so I got a taste of it there. I would say by the grace of God, like I always knew God was real, but didn't know Jesus, like didn't know a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what childhood looked like. It's interesting really. that you say, it's interesting. I love how you really touched on you know, what may have been lacking, but then the role that you have now to yeah. invest that yeah. Yeah. into families. It's yeah. just so full circle. I love yeah. it. We'll get to that a little bit later, yeah. but I just love the way that God works. Like that became a passion of yours. Clearly, you know, as you were going, that people would have those little seeds planted at a young age. It's so beautiful to see how God works through it. So, okay. So obviously you're hearing from family members more yeah. about who God is by the, you said, by the grace of God, I always knew. I love how yeah. He, no matter what, he's written the truth on your heart and you can't escape it when you were yeah. born before he, you know, he's knitting you together yeah. in your mother's womb and you're able by the grace of God throughout your life to remember, oh my goodness, there's God out there. Something, something's yeah. real. And so yeah. tell us, okay, so you've got seeds planted through your, your family members, your aunt specifically, you remember. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that first interaction with that aha moment with Jesus and somebody introducing you or what did that look like for you? Yeah, that's so good. Oh gosh, I feel like I could go so many ways. Um, so I would say all the way through college, even identity was in boys, of course, right? I didn't see a biblical marriage or relationship ever modeled in my life. And um, sports and basketball was my main sport. And so it was those two things. That's where you find your identity, your security. And so that's what I chased through high school. I wasn't um, like party or anything like that. It was like family, sports, a boyfriend, um, obviously living in sin. And, um, I would say, I think it was my senior year of high school. I had, um, committed to play college basketball and I saw a friend post, it was Calvary at the time at Miller North on Instagram. And we had been, my family had been going to King of Kings here and there. Growing up also, we went to a Lutheran church. And so it was one of the things where on Wednesdays, parents would drop you off at midweek. And it was more of the religion of like, Hey, you need to learn, um, the New Testament books of the Bible, memorize Matthew 6, 33, but that was it. You know, I didn't have, I didn't know why. And um, so I went to Calvary at the time and fell in love with it. But also I would run in and run out, like, don't look at me, don't talk to me. I just want to <laughs> see what it's all about. And I loved it. I really loved it. Didn't get connected. Didn't know what being surrounded or community was like. How old were you? A senior in high school. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, um, so I went off to college, which was 30 minutes away, just one, because I'm a homebody and I wanted to stay close, uh, but I played basketball. So I would come back um, when I could. And then when we weren't traveling, I would watch online. But I think it was my junior year that, let's see. Yeah, junior year about that, the Elkhorn South campus was open. So I was able to come uh, more regularly and got connected with love kids. So was serving, but still really wasn't like in small group, wasn't, I wouldn't say fully surrendered really, like didn't know what that looked like. Um, and this is a large part of my testimony, but in college I played basketball and it was one of those things where chasing men, um, started dating a guy. And it was one of those things where it's like, you, uh, just date to date, had no end goal, no, nothing. <sighs> Knowing that there was no like biblical marriage modeled. And so it's like, I don't know what you're, you know, why are you dating? I had no idea. I just thought you did it because everyone else was doing it, which shortly led to an engagement, which shortly led to, well, to an engagement to someone who didn't know Jesus. Whereas I had an understanding, but wasn't fully surrendered, um, which then led to bawling my eyes out to my mom saying, I can't marry him. Ended the engagement, um, super hard, 
I know it's the Lord's protection now because I'm married to the most amazing godly man. And I'm so thankful for that. And it's a sacrificial thing. So like, gosh, I didn't see that in my parents' marriage and now I have it. And so what I went through really wasn't fun. It was horrible, mm. but now I know, you know, what it yeah. looks like. So with that being said, that's really sacrificial things really quick. Oh, yes. People listening might be like, what is she talking about? Yeah. Yep. So, um, God, thank you that I was in that broken relationship. You took me out of it. It, it hurt. It sucked. I saw you in it. And now I'm giving thanks for that because I have your best or mm. like my parents' marriage. I didn't see you growing up but now I do in my own marriage and it took like oops it took that moment of um hurt turning and now knowing God's yeah. best of like God thank you that I went through that because now I know your best it's really the gospel yeah yeah because ultimately you just said like I repented of this broken relationship yeah because you called it out it was sin right yep. like yep absolutely. we knew this man wasn't after the Lord yeah. and then from there as soon as you said yes it's so cool how God then you repent and turn to him and then he changes yeah. the plan and he yeah. opens a door. And it's so sweet to see in your life what's... So tell us, okay, so you're talking about junior year, you were invited, you're getting to know Jesus, you're pursuing the Lord. He's convicting yeah. you clearly yep. because you're making choices now mm -hmm. that are honoring to him by breaking off a relationship that you know wasn't yeah. for him or didn't have him at the center. Yeah. So things must have gotten more serious between you and Jesus in that moment. Tell yeah, us a little bit about absolutely. some times in your life where you feel like God marked that season of your life and maybe yeah. like you said, I knew about God, but I wasn't really following him. So tell us more about when that started. Yeah, I would say at that point, so it ended the um, relationship, got plugged into Love Kids and was mentored and discipled by Mandy Petro, which I'm sure you guys all know, just the most amazing woman of God. And um, yeah, I got connected and really that's what changed my life. I always knew I had a heart for kids, but being in community at the same time um, is why I'm here today. And uh, anyways, and so I would say the moment that I really encountered the love of Jesus, I was done with that relationship. My brother, sister-in-law, and a few of our friends went to um, a conference called Jesus Image in Orlando. It was Jesus Image 20, I believe. Um, yep. And so like some of my heroes in faith, like Stephanie Gretzinger, like, um, the Culianos yeah. family, that's who leads it. And I remember being very much encountered by the love of Jesus, um, like wrecked by the Holy Spirit, just nothing that I had tasted before. Of course, had got a taste of it at Love Church, but I wasn't totally plugged in to where I knew that. And so I got a side of like the charismatic Christianity of like the prophetic and, you know, tongues and um, spontaneous worship. And I fell in love. And mm. so that was the night that I remember raising my hand, fully surrendering my life to the Lord. Mm. At the same time back here was connected um, to love kids. I wasn't in a small group yet. And I remember we were driving back to the hotel and I said, whatever that was, I want more of it. And of course, it's not the experience or like the feeling that was driving yeah. my faith, but like, I had seen a different side of Jesus and had that encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I remember my sister-in-law said, well, I went to YWAM. There's this thing called YWAM, had no understanding of what it was. And that's what led to coming back, wrestling with the Lord of, I love, love kids. I love serving. Um, but is Jesus worth giving up six months of my life and what I was comfortable with, which led to Hawaii mm -hmm. and Africa and <laughs> really changed six months that changed my life. <laughs> I love it. So what I hear you saying is you took a step of faith after yeah. God used this incredible weekend encounter with him. Yeah. Yep. And as you walked away from that, he impressed on your heart more open door through an in-law. Yeah. Maybe you didn't know about that ministry before, but now God's opened your eyes to it. So you go, and we love to call that consecrated, right? Because the Bible talks about setting yourself apart. Yeah. And, and I know there, he probably did some work on the inside there. What would be, when you set yourself apart for those six months, give us a, a couple of things that you felt like, he marked me with this during that time. He increased my faith or he did this thing and I know that I had a different experience and it looked like. Tell us a little bit about your yeah. time there and your takeaways. Yeah, it was the best. Um, the first three months we were in Hawaii and it was the Bible school. So it was learning more about the Bible, reading the Bible, the nature and character of God. And then you're sent into um, you know, a different nation. So I ended up in Uganda. The first part of it was solely just in the time difference between Hawaii and here. Didn't have much contact with 
you know, with my family. And that's all I knew before. I was so comfortable in that. And so there it was me, the Lord. I made a best friend there that I talked to weekly. Like we met on the plane, just the craziest God story. Um, so there was there was more that the Lord had for me, but it was me, him, the Bible. And I read through the entire Bible <laughs> morning and night. Like there was so much time on your hands that you would just spend in the Bible, which is funny because the heart of Love Church of being a self-feeder is I got a taste of that. And so I fell in love with the word of God, um, with prayer specifically as well. And then I would say the Lord always had um, a love for kids on my heart, but there we got to choose like a certain ministry to serve in. And mine was called, um, what was it called? It was some, oh, Mercy Ministries is what it was. And so we would go on the streets and we would hang out with kids and you'd share the gospel with them. And so, um, yeah, that was, I think the biggest thing though was falling in love with the word of God. Isn't he incredible? I think it's so fascinating. Before you were a Christian, you chose to pursue education. Yes yeah. or no? Yeah. yeah. So even yeah. before you said yes to Jesus, he already put on your heart his desire and design for you to yeah. pursue. And he's so faithful, right? Yeah. So to stir up that gift beforehand, then you were serving before you even were sold out, surrendered to the Lord and love kids. Yeah. Then he invites you into a ministry that happens to be you setting yourself apart. But then on the other end of it, you get to go into the field that you love and be yeah. with kids again. Do you yeah. see the thread of yep. like the way throughout? <laughs> it's just so fun to watch his hand on people's lives. And clearly yeah. that's still going on today. Yeah. So you come. So what I heard you say in that time apart, it, that time that you were set apart, consecrated unto the Lord, you drew near. Yeah. You learned some, and I love to call it like avenues to the kingdom. Like you learned avenues to the kingdom, how to be with him, how to be in him, yeah. prayer, getting in the word and reading the Bible in three months, Maddie, that's incredible. That's yeah. like, talk about changing your life, Yep. right? Like yep. pulling out anything that maybe the world taught you and putting in his truth and yeah. that season of separation. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> so yeah. fast forward, you're coming home. It's what year? 2021? 22? 22. Yeah. Um, maybe 21. Okay. Yep. Because I've been with love for two and a half years. So. so you're on your way home from this crazy mission on the field. So you're in Uganda. Yeah. You get yeah. back to Omaha, Nebraska. Tell us a little bit about what transformed at that point. <laughs> yeah. I remember going back and thinking um, – the Joel 225 of like, God's going to restore the year, the years that the locusts had, you know, taken or stolen or eaten. And I came back to nothing in my bank account, living with my parents at 23, um, no job. And you're like, this and does not look like restoration, yeah, Lord. Yes. <laughs> yep. And I just went kind of through this traumatic three months in Uganda, really lack of even drinking water, didn't shower. You're going to the bathroom in a hole, but at the same time they knew Jesus so dear or so closely really because that's all they had um but I came back and I remember <laughs> my family welcomed me and that was even a weird thing of like I haven't like touched you in six months and you were my everything before like how do I even interact with you mm -hmm. and I came home to a bunch of gifts and I remember feeling so kind of sad but also mad of like I had nothing I had everything with Jesus, but like these kiddos had nothing. They didn't have clothes. They didn't have parents, places to live. And I'm coming home to a car, a house, parents that were going to provide for me, all those things. So I just remember thinking like, can I just sell everything? Like Jesus is enough. And I saw that there. Um, so that's kind of really what led to it on the same, at the same time, when I mentioned Mandy, she has an awesome story to tell on her own and it's not mine to tell, but God had been doing some stuff in her heart as, um, yeah, calling her to be a homemaker. And I was um, interviewing for a teaching job and they were going to offer me the job that day. And I remember at the same time coming back and getting connect connected with Mandy and Pastor Ben again. And Mandy, I called her. I said, hey, can I use you as a reference? Because reference, they're going to offer me this job. And the same day she said, actually, I need to talk to you. Like, can we have a meeting with Denise, Pastor Ben, and me and you? Um, which led to me working. I think it was within a week that I started working. And really I came back and love was my dream job. It always had been. And I'm like, well, Mandy is so stellar at this job. It, you know, she's never leaving. And of course it's the Lord and his kindness and faithfulness to like bring her into a different season. That's mm -hmm. so amazing, but just wild. 
And it's so funny because we had been praying for you in that role before you even left for YWAM. And no idea. <laughs> yeah, and, and you had no idea. But we had been praying for months and months and months and asking the Lord, is this what you desire? And so for him to like set us all up that way, you know, and just put seeds in each of our hearts yeah. to be like minded. And it's funny when I walk through Love Kids, I think of you as like the quote unquote principal, <laughs> like, yeah. like really yeah. directing. And, yeah. and and it's interesting, too, because you're not just loving on the children. You're you're encouraging teachers and families families yeah. to co-labor with the Holy Spirit and teaching their children yeah. about what you you said that you were lacking growing mm-hmm. up, right? Like, Absolutely. I think it's a beautiful picture of the grace of God and the yeah. burden that he's given you. It's yeah. just so sweet. And you're blessing so many families. And so we just want to say thank you, first of all, for your willingness. I know you said it doesn't feel like a job to you, but let me tell you, like, without your willingness, without your yes, so many families would be missing out. Yeah. And we would be missing out. So we treasure your willingness. And what you're doing also is you're setting people on fire to know the truth of how to take care of and point the next generation to Jesus. And that's like, I know that's your passion. Absolutely. (laughs) Go back a little bit, though. I want to hit on the part where you talked about your experience in Uganda. I want to make sure nobody missed that. Yeah. The things that you were lacking versus we had everything because. Mm -hmm. And so the, the challenge of that first step on the field and seeing what you're lacking versus you leaving. Give us a little bit of that contrast in that story, like going in knowing, oh my goodness, I have nothing, but then coming out in the difference. So just kind of give us, wrap that up for us, like going in what you felt like, coming out what you felt like. Yeah, going in being so scared, never, I had been to Mexico, but never leaving the country. It was on Christmas Eve, we were flying all day. I was away from my family. I was calling my mom in the airport bathroom stall bawling because I was missing out on Christmas. <laughs> um, I think we got to Uganda midnight. You go to this airport where there's um, soldiers, really, and there's guns everywhere, and their English is very, very much lacking, and we don't know. Luganda is what they, they were speaking where we were at. Um, we had to go into this little tent to get some, like, a yellow fever vaccine. Otherwise, you're not allowed into... Mm-hmm the country. Um, I remember we got on a bus and, and I was 20, 23. We had two 19 year olds leading our team to Uganda. No one had ever been there before. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, I remember driving, we had to drive like six hours from the airport to, um, we were in Mitiana and there were guards that would stop us every probably hour with guns. They would, it was pitch dark there were guns. They would walk around the van. Like, is everything okay? So just being so, so, so terrified. Getting to um, the house that we were staying in and house, take it as you will, but sleeping on the floor, 12 of us in one little living room space. And um, yeah, just, I Even think- Even just that, la- pause for a second, 12 yeah. bodies on one floor sharing yeah. a space for yeah. three months. Yep. And the coolest thing is there was a little, there was um, a couple on our team in their thirties with a little boy who was, I think four. So getting to have that journey also with a kid, seeing a kid like on the mission field and being able to, you know, bring that back yeah. to love kids has been great, but yeah, just lacking really everything like worldly that we have here of like, I wore the same clothes for months. Um, safety. We had a security guard that had a bow and arrow made out of sticks. People tried to break into our house almost nightly. Um, witchcraft was huge. Um, people didn't know the name of Jesus. They didn't have Bibles in their own language. So I think just, I remember actually the, the day we woke up, I went out to spend time with the Lord and I heard laughter outside of the gates. And of course you just see a little African baby and you're so in love. Like you're the cutest thing I've ever seen. And I go out there and it's a little boy and it's like the red dirt in Africa and there's no houses. It's just really like shacks. And he was naked, didn't have any clothes. He was maybe three, had a pop bottle off cause they, there's trash everywhere with um outside of a tire. And he was like pushing it around and just giggling like so <laughs> much. And I just remember thinking like you are so happy and content because really this is all you know. But even the the littlest kids at that age knew Jesus. I remember being in church services there, women would pray for three hours on their faces. Wow. Like just so different because they don't have anything but Jesus. And so that's what I left with of like, if everything was stripped away from me, I know Jesus is enough. But I know the Lord also had in his plan for me to be born here and to have a heart for the nations to go. So also, you know, being so thankful for what we have here, but also using the gifts and the resources and what I can, you know, 
to help. I usually ask this at the end, but I want to ask you now, yeah. what would you say to the one who feels intimidated to step out on the mission field because yeah. of all the things they're fearful of? Yeah, that's so good. It sounds so Christianese, but like Jesus is so worth it. <laughs> like he's worth every single thing. Like mm-hmm. no matter your safety, giving up comfort, no matter what it looks like, he changes everything. And, um, yeah, I would just say it's like the Isaiah 30, 21 of like hearing his voice and stepping in that and walking that way. I'm like, you hear the voice of God, be obedient in it. You don't know what he wants to do with it and what, you know, um, encounters or how he's going to change your life. But just being bold and knowing like Jesus is worth, you're, you know, and just saying like, God, God, you're worth the next breath. You're worth everything. But like, I, I would give, you know, that time. And I encourage everyone, whatever it looks like, Jesus is worth giving up, mm-hmm. you know, anything that's comfortable. So it's hard, it's hard if you've never been on the mission field, what to anticipate and all the stories yeah. you hear. I actually talked to somebody earlier this morning who had never been on these, um, and he took a position where he has to go to different mission trips all year long. So he's been to like 10 yeah. countries in the last couple of months, and he's just floored at the opportunity and the way that God has blessed him in growing closer to the Lord. Yeah. And it's interesting because you think of all the things you won't have, yep. you know, and yep. what I hear you saying is you walked away with being content yeah. and so much more than you were before. Yeah, and absolutely. And knowing who God really is, like really experiencing his power. I'm imagining that you walked away with so many different circumstances where he revealed certain characteristics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I would even say on that too, it's funny, full circle, I'm married now, happily married. We have a son on the way. But just even, yeah, even telling my husband, like, I love you so much, but like, you're not even enough. You know, it's like, if Jesus isn't the main thing, that's right. And if he's not enough for you, nothing else ever will be. And I'm always reminded of Ecclesiastes of like, anything you do outside of Jesus, you're just chasing the wind and it leaves you empty. So I'm like, Jake, I love you more than anything in the world, but I'll always love God more. And so it's like the understanding of Jesus has to be your everything, no matter how much you hear it and how you know, how it doesn't really register until it registers, so. What's really sweet about you coming to that revelation is this. Earlier you said, from the outside, it looked like we had everything all together as a family. And really we put things in the place of Jesus. uh, 1 John 5, 21 says that if we put, if anything takes the place of God in our heart, it's idolatry. So whether it's our family and now this new little baby coming, right? Your husband, like you just mentioned, we don't realize that we're idolizing until we realize when Jesus fulfills us Mm -hmm. and satiates our soul. So it's so sweet to hear, even though it felt like you had everything you needed in those moments, God still brought crazy revelation of what it looked like to be contented in him, to be satisfied with him. So beautiful, Maddie. Thank you so much for sharing. Tell us, okay, so you you talked about how you got to love church. You talked about how self-feeding has become a discipline and, and, and how you really just read through the entire Bible <laughs> when you were over there in Uganda. Tell us a little bit about how Love Church and the 5S Life has blessed you and just practicing what our mission slash yeah. vision has been. Yeah, I could not. I could probably also talk on this for multiple hours. Love Church has changed my life, and I really mean that. Every S that you look at, I could talk about. I would say, one, going through the surrender was a process. Being surrounded was the biggest thing. Getting surrounded in Love Kids changed my life. And I tell people that when they start to serve and love kids. I'm like, it is my testimony. Your testimony is different, but it changed my life. Mm. It's not only leading these kids and shaping and molding their hearts, but you're making friendship with, you know, other people after God's heart. Um, Self-fed has been the biggest thing. And you and you and PT model it so perfectly and so practically of like, that's what drives your everyday, drives your life. And it's, it, it is so simple. It's like get into the daily reading, like get to know God on your own. Mm. And Yeah, I just, it's changed Jake and I's lives 100%. Um, And you're even hosting a Bible study in your home right now. Yep. I love it. Yeah. And then just the the part of being sent, and I learned so much of that from you, of like, there's opportunity everywhere. Are you going to seek it out or be willing to? And so I think every S at Love Church. Tell us a little about, you, you come from, you're living in Omaha, Nebraska before you get married. Yeah. Or maybe before you moved out to Tecumseh, right? That's what uh, Tecuma. Tecuma. Yep. Tecuma. Yep. When you went to Tecuma, you, before, was it before that you lived there you started serving in the volleyball? Tell us a little bit about that yeah. whole outreach. Yeah. Oh, that's been so great. Um, I, well, let's see. How did that even? Talking about being sent. Yeah. Yeah. I, so we live in Tecuma and Oakland is like 15 minutes west of us. And 
I think how it started, well, Jake works with some um, people that live in Oakland and we got on a sand volleyball team there, which led to me subbing once a week on, you know, one of the days that I had free time. And they just simply asked me, can you coach volleyball or would you be willing to? And I remember telling Jake, I was like, I just don't think I have the capacity for it. What, what, what kind of people? Oh, high schoolers. Yeah. Kids. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and I remember had a good conversation with Jake and he challenged me, you know, to do it, obviously, if you're hearing from the Lord. And um, I did it. The first day I showed up to practice, one of the seniors had a, I think it was just Jesus Loves You shirt on. And I said, God, you are so, you're in the details, like we talked about. Went up to her and I, you have to be careful because one, I don't know anybody there. It's a public school. And um, kind of asked her just what her faith looked like and spiraled to leading them through 15 of them through the blue book come throughout on. the summer. They come to love church, not consistently because they have a church that they help with back yeah. in Oakland, but they even say to this day, love church has changed their life mm. too. Cause in a small town, you don't have access to, right. you know, social media wise or technology, but small, that's small an incredible opportunity. Like you going to play Sam Bible opens the door for yeah. 15 girls to know Jesus. And those of you that don't know what the blue book is, it's our main discipleship tool one-on-one. -on -one. She's got 15 girls in the study <laughs> in it and they're learning. You go through seven books of the Bible and these different things. And so your yes equals 15 girls lives yeah. changed for so long. So yeah. I just want to say, praise God for your step of faith after step of faith after step of faith that's changing, not just your life here, but people in Uganda, people in Tekema here. It's just incredible. Your faith is incredible and it's beautiful to watch. And I know we have so much more that we can celebrate, but we're gonna wrap it up here <laughs> okay. and bring this to a close. Um, if you right now would celebrate God and the things that he's doing in your life, tell us what you're most grateful for in this yeah. season, even just this season or in life in general about what you learned about him. Yeah, oh gosh, um, kind of in the same thing. I'm celebrating the baby that we get to have in 20 weeks or so. Um, and just the part of sacrificial things of like not seeing a biblical marriage, not being raised to know Jesus and no, so much grace to my parents, you know, but, um, again, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so to be able to one, understand like, God, thank you for this gift that you've given Jake and I to give back to you, but the chance and opportunity, of course, we're not going to do it perfect. Um, but to raise a disciple of Jesus, I'm so excited, so grateful. And it's, yeah, it's just, I think it goes back to the identity and the security that I didn't have growing up that I found right in Jesus in and love kids. That's what we teach and then get an opportunity to raise one, if not more down the road to, you know, find identity and security in Jesus. So God's so faithful and he's so much fun. I love that the thread that we see throughout is just your, I think like your thumbprint on his kingdom, the way that he moves through you to reach next generation. It's beautiful. Thank you. Such a treasure. How would you, I know we already challenged the listeners stepping out on the mission field, but how yeah. today, thinking on your story and thinking about how some people might relate, there are some times that were pretty tough, you know, that you mentioned you know, in your past, but how would you challenge some of the listeners, encourage some of the listeners today to take a step of faith or even have hope in some of the circumstances that you may have found yourself in? What hits your heart right now to really encourage listeners? Yeah, I would say specifically, I mean, trial and tribulation is always going to be there. And it's like, obviously, who are you turning to? What are you turning to? But as simple as community is getting surrounded, getting mm. connected, having the accountability piece of it and people that are going to champion you and hold your arms when you need it, whether that be when you're not knowing the Lord to knowing the Lord to going through things, knowing the Lord, you have to have people in your corner that want God's best mm. for your life. So I would simply just say, get surrounded. It's so easy to isolate. Um, but yeah, I love that. Yeah. It's so fun too. When you were sharing your story, you talked about how someone, dis Mandy discipled you and yep. how much that meant to you, yep. right? And sometimes it's scary when, when you're brand new to a church or you're brand <laughs> yeah. new to community, you're like, wait, what? I don't know, I don't wanna be vulnerable. There's something yep. about learning to be vulnerable. You mentioned earlier, as we were meeting before our time here today, um, you, took, you took a step of faith and you went through some heart processing to, yeah. to really ask the Lord to heal you in certain areas. You earlier mentioned stepping away from an engagement. So I wanna challenge you right now, Somebody going through a hard um, moment in their life in the way that you were, 
how would you encourage what came out of your willingness to process? And then you talked about processing some other things thereafter. So the person who just hasn't taken the time to take their heart to the Lord and maybe even step out in faith and be obedient like you were in that moment. So those listeners that are here today, how would you challenge A, step out in obedience and or B, heart processing or taking some of the stuff that's deep in our hearts stored to the Lord? What would you do? How would you What would be a first step? How would you encourage? Yeah, I think it's simply to one, you have to be hearing from the Lord. Like you need to know, be able to discern his voice from, you know, outside or the enemies. But so one, it goes back to being a self feeder, being surrounded, being around people who um, want God's best for you. But you have to be able to hear God's voice to be able to be obedient and to know what he's asking of you. And then just being bold in that, obviously, and, and fearless of stepping out, knowing like, God, if you said it, you're going to do it. And if, I, if I'm if i willing, you're going to use it and you're going to help me along the way. Um, and then, yeah, process, processing your heart like you teach, it's it's a daily thing almost. Like, um, yeah, first step for me was the part of being surrounded too, of like letting go of shame, of fear, um, condemnation, any of those things. But like finding someone who's more seasoned than you that – that kind of knows how to help you get through that. Of course, Jesus is going to heal you fully. Um, you know, it's always a process, but going through it with someone who, who's a little bit more seasoned than you and can help you through it. And teach you what it looks like to be pointed back to him. Yeah, yeah. that's so yep. beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much. I know there's so much more I could pull out. You are like a literal mine filled with gold nuggets from heaven, <laughs> and I could pull out 45 million more pieces of gold from you. But for the listener's time's sake, we are going to pause here. And I just want to say, Maddie, you're a treasure. Every time people are with you, they're experiencing the joy, the love, and the kindness of the Father. You really pour that out on everyone, not just the children. I'm talking the teachers that work with you. Everyone I talk to that knows you is so encouraged by you. And so I just want to say thank you for being the fragrance of Christ everywhere you go. Yeah. You're beautiful. Thanks for modeling it. <laughs> You're so sweet. Could you do me a favor and could you pray and prophesy over the people listening yeah. today, however the Lord would lead you and just let's leave them on a great note. Yeah, we absolutely. thank you so much for taking time out of your day and listening to the Love Church Story Podcast and Maddie Clayton's story. (laughs) God is so worthy to be praised. It's so fun to hear and allow us to just hang on to hope from other people's story, maybe even borrow hope for some. And then also our faith increases when people testify. So I love how um, the Bible says that by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, it's so sweet when people are willing to say, yes, this is what God has done and this is what he will do in you. So if you could encourage through prayer and just maybe even prophesy. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Jesus, we love you so much. We're so thankful for you. We're so thankful um, just for life, thankful just for the times that you you bring us back to the moment that we encountered you and what you've... um, brought us out of and brought us from. God, I thank you um, just for testimonies and like Genesis 50, 20 says, what the enemy meant for evil, God, that you're, yeah. that you'll turn, that and you'll turn to good and you'll use for good. And so, God, I just pray that every person listening to this podcast would know their worth, that they would know their identity, that their security is found in you and you alone. And that two feet in the world, one foot in the world, it won't get you anywhere. It'll leave you empty. Jesus, you're the only thing that satisfies. Um, And so, God, we just say you're worthy of everything, really. You're in all the details. Um, God, I pray today that someone would be encouraged to step out in boldness boldness and fearlessness, that they would, um, yeah, take a chance to get connected, to be surrounded, um, and that they would live out the 5S life, Mm -hmm. knowing that, um, yeah, it's so so life-changing and yeah, just thinking of um, yeah sacrificial things in the in the way that um, that these listeners would be able to yeah learn more about that, be able to apply it to their lives. Of it's so easy to sit in. This should have you know gone this way, or what if it went this way? But God, thank you that you're using it, and I can give you sacrificial things for that. You know, for your best for my life. Mm. Um, yeah, God. So we just pray security, identity. Um, And just, yeah, just the picture of you placing a crown on every single, um, I'm just thinking female specifically, but on their heads, knowing that they are bought with the price, that they're they're so worthy, you call them worthy. And so would, um, yeah, any lie or attack from the enemy leave in the name of Jesus? And would they know that they're so worthy and that you see them, you know them, you love them? 
and you chose them in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You're incredible. Thank you so much today for your testimony. We love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We can't wait to see you next time.